people to hold questions till the end. No, they can interrupt me at any point. Okay. Unless it gets out of hand, but okay, with, Jar with John show. Charles here at me. Yeah, he comes. He's a frequent visitor. Dill. I'm a faculty member in the School of Urban Studies and Planning, and along with Rob Bertini, um, helped co-organize this seminar. And I, before I introduce our speaker, I want to remind you that we are uh, webcasting, and therefore, if you ask questions, please use the microphone in front of you. You need to hold down on the touch button while you're speaking. Keep holding it. Keep the red light on while you're asking your question. Then let it go, and we'll get an answer to your question. So please remember to do that. Uh, so without further ado, I'm going to introduce G.B. Arrington, who is a senior professional associate at Parsons Brinkerhoff uh, and uh, formerly with TriMet, going to be talking about light rail transit in the American city. Without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to you. Great. It's, uh, it's, it's nice to actually be in Portland um, because in my, in my work at Parsons Brinkerhoff, I'm just about never here. Um, actually, my son is in the in the room, so he can attest to that. So this is our excuse to be able to see each other. <laughs> Hello, Michael. Um, what, what I'm going to talk about today, is, as Jennifer said, is light rail in the American city. It's based on uh, a paper that uh, the Transportation Research Board has just published, and then it's also based on a little bit of of the of my work in transit oriented development. Uh, because of being in Portland, uh, I've chosen to focus just about exclusively on light rail since there tends to be a lot of that here. Uh, and in my, in my practice at Parsons Brinkerhoff, um, I have uh, active projects underway in Los Angeles, in Orange County, in Chicago, in Atlanta, suburban Washington, D.C., Columbus, Charlotte, and then in uh, Melbourne, Australia. So, um, I guess that's part of the caveat for um, uh, being that it's nice to talk in Portland. Um, please ask questions at any point. Uh, I think these things work the best if they're interactive so that we can um, touch on what's interesting uh, to you. Um, so let's start. Um, the transit land use equation. Uh, t typically how we do these things is that land use lives in a silo. Um, and the land use talks to land use, and transportation lives in a silo, and they talk to each other. Uh, and when we integrate the two of them, the challenge is how do you break down the silos and at the end of the day try to create a more livable place. It's harder to do that. Uh, uh, more often now we're taught how to do that, but in, in the past that hasn't been the case. Uh, so from the, tra the transit land use integration, we typically refer to as transit oriented development, TOD. Uh, Let's start with some definitions. Uh, from my perspective, it has six key elements. It's moderate to higher density, uh, and I think it's important not to use a number. It's not 15 units per acre or 25 units per acre or four units per acre. The key is, is that the density needs to be related to the place uh, because the place should define what transit does, not that transit defines what the place does. Uh, it needs to be within an easy walk of transit Typically, that's five minutes, but if the place is more mixed use, uh, the walk shed uh, can, can extend further. Uh, so then the next point is important. It's a mix of uses. Those uses can be vertical. They can be horizontal. They can be between a number of stations, or they can be at an individual station. The TOD itself needs to be designed for the pedestrian. One of the things that that implies is, is that you can have transit-oriented development before you have transit. It's called pedestrian-oriented. Um, and so you don't necessarily have to have the transit there first. Uh, because if it's pedestrian oriented, it'll work well after the transit arrives. It can be new construction or redevelopment. And then the last point, the re reason that transit agencies initially got interested in this, is that it, it increases transit ridership. And there's a lot of literature out there uh, that demonstrates those things. Now we have Todd. And then we have its evil brother, TAD, transit adjacent development. And in most transit stations in the United States, the development next to transit is a, t is a TAD, not a TOD. Uh, this top picture, uh, this is uh, Cisco Systems in these white buildings that uh, look remarkably like Kmart's. 
Um, in the middle of that uh, is the Champion Station in San Jose. Uh, it's a great place to go and to relax. There's art at the station, and no one will bother you. Um, and the reason for that is, as you can see, there's no relationship between the land use and the transportation. Um, so that's maybe an extreme case of what's typical at most rail stops in the United States, transit-adjacent development. Part of that is the case because TOD is illegal in most of the United States. It's not illegal because we took an overt action to make it illegal. It's illegal because we took no action to allow it. And what I mean by that is, is that uh, majority of the development codes require suburban densities, suburban setbacks, suburban parking requirements. And uh, so we need to take uh, often an overt act to allow transit-oriented uh, development to occur. So it's not enough that the development's next to transit. The development itself needs to be shaped by transit. Uh, and one of the more interesting examples of that uh, is, is the streetcar project in Portland. There was an article about that, I think, this morning in the Oregonian about what its subsidy is. And uh, Commissioner Francisconi was quoting, was saying, well, this is a project that was first about development and second about moving people. And uh, that's not how most of these projects are in the United States, but it's certainly uh, maybe a logical evolution of, of, of some of that conversation. Now, when you do these things well, there's a positive relationship between the proximity to transit and property values. Uh, these numbers are all summarized from university research. Uh, so these aren't just assertions or, or, or pulled out of the mouths of, of, of transit planners. Uh, and basically what all the numbers say is the same thing. The closer you are to transit, the higher the value is uh, based on uh, that proximity. Uh, Ken Duker at Portland State has done similar research that, that, that show these relationships. Um, I, I think the 10% number is, 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 uh, is, is a Portland State number. Uh, the San Jose and the Dallas numbers are, are maybe the most interesting because they're the most recent. There's, they're a 2002 and a 2003 study. Um, I don't know if this is a trend that the numbers are going to go up over time, but the other thing that we all know that it's going up over time is congestion. And so part of that value of being next to transit is that as our communities are more and more congested, that having that, uh, that access next to transit translates into more value. Now, we know from the research that, that the benefits of, of, of transit-oriented development uh, can be measured. Uh, at a regional scale, you can reduce vehicle miles, miles traveled by about 5%. Uh, in an individual station, you can increase ridership by about 40%. Uh, you can increase uh, transit ridership on a regional scale, about 5%. And then uh, because TOD is very similar to uh, uh, the compact development models that have been uh, evaluated, uh, the last number comes into place in terms of the opportunity to reduce infrastructure costs at a local level by up to 25%. All these need to be applied to specific places, but this is all summarizing the basis of the research. Now, there's also some financial incentives as, as uh, projects uh, chase very limited federal dollars and that it's easier to get federal funding if you're able to show that you have plans, policies, strategies, and existing land use conditions that are in place that are supportive of transit. Uh, and so you can move further ahead in the queue. Uh, to be able to get a recommendation uh, from the Secretary of Transportation on which projects will be funded. Uh, whether or not you think that's a good idea or not, it's, it's one that I hold close to my, uh, to my heart because I wrote the framework that the federal government uh, uses for that. So you can thank me or blame me. Um, and as the questions come up, we can figure out which one of those it is. Um, so what I want to shift into now is to talk about some broad strat some, some specific strategies for what it takes to be uh, successful with transit-oriented development. I'm then going to provide you some examples of uh, specific uh, uh, instances of that. And then I, um, I'm going to end by talking a little bit about what's happening with some of the other systems around the United States. But we'll do a lot of that as we, as we move through this. So the, the first key to success with, with TOD is to link it to a broader strategy for how the community wants to grow. Um, it needs to be part of the community's vision for what they think is important. Uh, the TOD needs to be seen of as a means to the end to the community's objective as opposed to an end in itself. Um, and, and to a certain extent, uh, 
um, asking the community to densify just because they're next to transit is the functional equivalent of saying that you need to densify because you're sitting on top of a big sewer. Because what we'd be doing is we're saying that infrastructure is supposed to drive your vision of how you're supposed to be as opposed to your own community's vision. So the first question in TOD is, what kind of a place do we want to have and how can the presence of transit help us get there? Um, and increasingly, that means bringing cities to the table. It's not enough just for the transit agencies to do that. Um, Portland Streetcar is, is I think, a, a great example of that. Uh, you know, it's 4.8 miles long. You know, there's another mile under construction. You can see the numbers there. Uh, just under $57 million in, in, in capital costs. Uh, over $900 million in new development along the edge of the line. Whether or not that development would have occurred otherwise is one part of the question. It certainly occurred in a different way. The timing occurred in a different way, tied to the streetcar. And it was clear that the streetcar was part of a broader strategy to bring more housing into the downtown and to change the shape of the downtown and to revitalize other areas. And so that, I think it's a clear example of that broader strategy piece. The other thing that's real interesting is that uh, you need to start early in planning for transit-oriented development. And I think if you use TriMet as a case study on this, what you'd see is the planning on transit-oriented development started earlier on the west side than it did on the east side. It started earlier on the airport than it did on the, on, on the, on the west side. It's starting early, it started very early on, on the interstate line, actually even before they started talking about the interstate line. The city of Portland had changed codes in anticipation that light rail might want to be there. Uh, similar things are, are, are happening in, in I-205. So the, I guess the, the throwaway line here is that in planning for TOD, it's a little bit like voting in Chicago. You need to do it early and often. Um, and the reason for that is, is, is the difference between planners and engineers. Engineers are very decisive and they like to make decisions and move forward. Planners like to contemplate and have conversations. Well, that creates a culture clash because while the planners are contemplating, the engineers have already decided and essentially the, 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 ho the horse got out of the barn. So to me, the important strategy is get the planners talking before the engineers are deciding so that we can shape projects around transit-oriented development without the risk of slowing the project down and having missed opportunities. This example in Gallatin um, is a great example. The, the city of Richardson uh, partnered with Nortel and then came to the transit agency and said to the transit agency, DART, the station's in the wrong place. We want to create a mixed-use civic center here. Please move your station. And they were able to do that before any of the engineering started so that there weren't extra costs in doing that. Uh, the west side in Portland is another classic example of that. Uh, when we were planning the west side project when I was at, at, at TriMet, there were three alternative alignments. The citizen activists wanted it to go out the Sunset Highway because that was the fastest way to get to Hillsboro. And the, the view there was speed is important. Let's go fast. That's what Ray Polani and Jim Howe advocated. Other people said, a lot of the people within TriMet said, let's go on the TV highway. That's where the buses are. So you'd be stupid to go out the freeway, put the train where the riders already are. And then the planners said, um, and, uh, let's put it on the abandoned Burlington Northern Rail Line because there's all this land here, and let's make a proactive decision, and let's be, I'll take the analogy that, you know, someone asked Wayne Gretzky why he was a, a great hockey player, and he said, well, I skate to where the puck is going to be. And what we tried to do on the west side was put the rail line where the development was going to be in the future, knowing that the urban growth boundary was there and that we could get plans and policies in place in advance of the rail line that we could then shape development and make a bold decision to spend a billion dollars to shape development. And that's what happened on the west side. And you can see uh, some of the numbers in terms of what's happened there. Now, it's easy to say that transit's a public good, and so that what we're really asking things for the change to be is in land use. But what I would argue that it's not enough just to be next to transit, because the transit needs to be development oriented if you want the land use to respond to it. And it's amazing how many times 
we in the transit industry do a really good job of just the reverse of that. You know, we select corridors that are abandoned rail corridors, different than the west side one, that maybe there was a good reason why that they were abandoned that they're not you know, really good places. We design stations around just automobile and bus access so that they turn their backs on communities. We stop planning for pedestrian connections to the station at the edge of the project right away because that's somebody else's problem. Let somebody else solve that problem. We surround the, the, the stations with parking so that we separate them. We don't have conversations with the communities. We don't even think about incorporating TOD in, into our projects, and so we don't build them to be uh, development friendly. If, they're gonna be, if we're going to have development-oriented transit, we need to design our systems in a different way. And in a series of cartoons, I want to talk to you about that. Um, here, we have a mixed-use village at the station. We've moved the park and rides away from the station. And you can see a number of examples of that, on, uh, where that's been done as, as well on the west side. One thing that transit agencies often say is, well, we want it to be convenient, so we not have to put it right next to the platform. And then if it's far, farther away, the commuters won't be able to figure it out. But the thing about commuters is, is they're creatures of habit. If they can find the parking space on Tuesday, they will find the parking space on Wednesday. Um, and so if you move it a little bit further away, you don't defeat the purpose. And actually, if then that they can walk through a, a mixed-use center, that, that they've helped the center and they've had a more pleasant experience in walking through the big parking lot. The bus transfer in this drawing is on street. So it's uh, rather than a separate facility. And then we've incorporated park and ride. Now this is what typically all those things look like. Uh, you put the parking right next to the station, then you create an additional barrier called the big bus transfer facility. Uh, and so then what happens is that the land uses respond in such a way that they're, they're suburban in their, t in their template because there's really no relationship other than proximity between the land use and the transportation. Now, so the choice is, you know, do we design our transit to be development oriented or do we design it to be automobile oriented and of course the choice isn't that simple because different stations are going to behave and perform in different ways and so part of planning for transit or retrofitting transit is to understand the function of different stations and to say this is an auto oriented station and it's okay to look like the one on the bottom but maybe this is more of a development oriented station and we want it to look more like the one on the top so we need to ask our transit to behave in a different way and to be engaged in terms of how it's designed to be able to do some of these things. Now the other thing that becomes really important is having the right tools. Uh, when I work with developers, what they tell me is that top bullet is absolutely the most important thing. What they want is the ability to actually go out and build transit-oriented development with one set of conversations with the community. What they don't want is to have to go back to the community over and over and over again to be able to put these things in place. The zoning for the high density, for the mix of uses, reductions in parking, if that's appropriate, building the building, uh, uh, bringing the buildings up to the street. So trying to get those, those entitlements in place early becomes really important. The other thing that's interesting is that if you have clear rules, then the developers at least know what they're being asked to do. And what you'll find is that developers would rather have more rules that are clear than less rules that aren't clear. Because the less rules that aren't clear translate into ambiguity. That means risk. They don't know how long it's going to take. They don't know what they need to do. So they avoid that. So sometimes complexity is actually a good thing um, as long as it's clear and it's predictable. Uh, other tools ne that are sometimes necessary are land assembly uh, because if you're working lots of times in already built up areas, uh, the development patterns are very fragmented and sometimes there's a public sector role to assemble land. We need to tell the truth when we're planning for these TODs. There will always be more traffic if there's more development. Transit's not going to make it go away. It just happens. So then the challenge is how do we tame the traffic? so that the people that are already in that community are less impacted by it. And so how do we design the cross sections of the streets and the sidewalks uh, to make those work? And then in some instances, financial or regulatory incentives will be necessary. 
Um, and I think what's really important is that we don't get into a situation where just because you're next to transit that you get an incentive. Because we only should do that when the market requires it because we're asking the market to do more than it may otherwise do in terms of, of density, in terms of affordability, in terms of design, uh, in terms of market timing. Those may be instances where incentives are appropriate. But let's don't get into a giveaway business just because we're next to transit. Englewood, Colorado is a, is a great example of uh, helping put the tools together. Uh, this was the first uh, major transit-oriented development project in Denver. Um, it was on the site of a failed mall. Uh, I'm going to tell you the name of the mall now, and you'll know kind of the, the era that it was built. It was called Cinderella City. Um, and when Cinderella City was built, it was the highest performing mall in the Denver region, meaning it had the greatest sales on a per square foot basis. But as Denver grew outward and more malls came into the marketplace, they cannibalized the market share for Cinderella City. It declined, and it became a what they call a dark mall, a dead mall, or what realtors call a non-performing real estate asset. Um, what the city did is that through eminent domain, it acquired the site. It did a TOD master plan. Uh, the master plan includes, it's now been all uh, built out, uh, 300 and, excuse me, 438 units of residential that was done by Trammell Crow, national developer with retail on the ground floor. On the other side of that main street, so the residential is here. This is the office with residential on the ground floor. They kept the old Merwins, uh, actually the old Foley's, excuse me, and uh, turned that into a, civic, a city hall and a civic center. Now there's two weird things about this one. At one end, it's anchored by Walmart because this is a low-end community. So it's got big box there, and the city actually has some uh, controls in place to control what happens in the future with that big box. The other thing is, is the things that are closest to transit are actually structured parking. This is the structured parking for uh, the transit, and this is the structured parking for the, um, for the residential. And that's because right next to the rail, the light rail line is a heavy rail freight line that carries coal trains about 80 car coal trains. And that's not something that you want to have all your development next to. And so the, the development relationships here are different than in that cartoon I showed you because the transportation corridor is different. Now the other thing that you can think about doing is leveraging project land. As we build these projects, there's an opportunity to acquire real estate. Um, you, have to have, you have to have sites to where you're going to be able to build things. And so at Collins Circle, for example, uh, there's a TOD there. That's where they assembled the equipment to build the West Side Tunnel. But the decision was made to acquire that site first as a development parcel and second as a construction mobilization site so it could be turned into a TOD later. There are, you have opportunities whether you make a full or a partial take of land. When the light rail turned at 18th and Jefferson, it went through an automobile dealership. TriMet could have bought part of the site. They chose to buy the entire site. And actually, uh, the landowner took them to court. And through TriMet winning uh, that court suit, the courts clarified that transit-oriented development was part of the public purpose of what TriMet was supposed to do. But it wasn't clear in TriMet's enabling legislation, so it actually came out of that. And then you can use DOT land, and Center Commons is an example of that. And I'll talk about Center Commons later. So here's Collins Circle. Uh, I, it's arguably one of the highest density TODs uh, in Portland. It's at 235 units per acre, uh, which is extremely high density, given that it's all wood frame construction uh, with retail on the ground floor. Uh, TriMet wrote down the cost of the land there, so the developer, uh, uh, same people that are doing the brewery blocks, were able to, uh, to do that project. Um, and what, what TriMet was trying to get was a uh, demonstration of higher density and mixed use uh, and really to try to push the envelope as well as a little bit of money. Now the other thing that's important in this stuff is understanding the market. Who's going to live in these TODs? Who are you building these for? Um, and so uh, there's been some large changes in, in the underlying demographics. And if we were having this conversation a decade ago, 
who we would be building TODs for would be different than who we're building them for today because as uh, the baby boom is moving through this, you know, the stomach of the bull constrictor, uh, that's changing um, some of the demographics and the shadow of the baby boom as well. And so what we're seeing is a doubling of demand nationwide for homes within a walking distance of stores. We're seeing a, a rapid increase in buyers who have a preference for more dense and compact homes. And that 31% uh, who prefer th uh, that growth in that, that segment is actually the largest uh, household segment in the United States in terms of how this one demographer had broke this down. The other big thing is the number of households with children are declining. Less than one out of three households in the United States has a child under 18 at home. So when we talk about, well, what the market wants single family, that's not today's market. That may be the market in 30 years, but it's not today's market. <coughs> to that market of the a family with kids at home is largely supplied by the existing housing stock in our communities. So how, how are we going to build for those uh, two out of three households that don't have any children at home? Some of them are younger, some of them are older, uh, and a lot of them can have their needs met by TODs. Avalon Basel REIT it means a real estate investment trust. It means that they're run out of Wall Street. They operate in the 25 largest metropolitan markets in the United States. Portland's 26th, so they don't operate in Portland. <laughs> These are their numbers in terms of what they target for transit-oriented development. Um, and this is actually numbers specifically for the San Francisco Bay Area. They'll be a little bit different in other market segments. But their, their target are people that are 25 to 34 and 65 plus. They're looking for what they call urban couples and singles high household income because this is brand new uh, product that they co would call a luxury product. They're interested in, in ethnically mixed households. And then look at the, the positioning. This is their, how they sell their product. Urban experience, suburban indulgence. Live in luxury, <coughs> skip the commute, quick uh, commute, quality lifestyle. So the, the, you know, the positioning is really interesting. But the people that spend more on market research than housing people are Hollywood. They spend the most on market research. And I think it's real interesting, and you may have heard people talk about this before, but America's most popular television shows are all situated in an urban setting. Okay? It's not leave it to beaver out in the suburbs. Again, it's about those changes in demographics. Today's demographics of friends and all those other things are urban. Okay? And so we need to understand that the, that the market is, in fact, moving more and more in that direction. But when we're planning for transit-oriented development, we also have to plan for cars because cars are still going to be the biggest piece of the pie so that they drive the market, particularly if you want retail in your transit-oriented development. You've got to deal with the automobile, period. It's non-debatable. It's just the truth. Um, and the retail rep requires visibility, so you have to understand the dynamics of how you plan for retail. On the transportation end, that means that we need to balance the traffic that's going through the TOD and the, the traffic that's circulating within the TOD. And we need to plan for multimodal streets, uh, which means more walking, more transit, and cars in that street ca cross section as opposed to just the car. And there are a lot of different ways uh, that we can do that. The Gre Gresham Civic Neighborhood is, is um, a uh, a response for how to do that uh, in, in the Portland market. Um, it's a project that's, a, uh, that's still in the works. I'm not sure it's by any means a perfect project, um, but I think it's, it's worth talking about to illustrate some of the points here. Uh, the city uh, provided leadership in trying to make sure that the development that occurred there was going to be both auto-oriented and transit-oriented. So it meant that they said no to a whole bunch of other development proposals before they got this one. There are a lot of big boxes in the suburban market, and there are big boxes in the Gresham Pacific neighborhood. But what they did is that they asked the big box to behave. And how they did that is that if you look in the site plan or you look on, in some of the drawings, the big boxes come up to the edge of the street. They're not set back from the street. Then in front of the big box isn't a parking lot, but it's a street. And then the parking for the big box is across the street. 
So they're asking the big box to be urban. The second thing, that by creating that grid as, and having a grid for parking as opposed to pods for parking, is that grid becomes development parcels. You can't redevelop a pod. It just doesn't work in terms of how the development fundamentals work. But you can relocate a grid. And so what, what the Gresham Civic Neighborhood is set out to do is to be able to intensify over time by changing those parking lots into development parcels. And so it will urbanize over time. Some of those parking lots will become parking structures because the car will still need to be there. But if you do the parking lot right, then you have activity on the ground floor. So it's a template for how this neighborhood will change and intensify over time. Now we need to design for the pedestrian. I talked about that before in the definition of transitorian development. When I think about the pedestrian, I think about it on three levels. We need to think about how you go from the community to the transit platform. And when I talked about development-oriented transit, I talked about some of the challenges for how we don't do a good job for that. Um, and, and a lot of that's about partnership. We need to design the TODs themselves so that they're walkable, so it's easy to walk around them. And then we need to think about the connections from the TOD back into the community so that the TOD relates to what's already there and uh, can reinforce that. Now, I, st I gave you in that, that kind of Todd versus Tad uh, a bad example in San Jose. So here's a better example in San Jose. Uh, this is a Reba. This is an e-retailer. Uh, they're actually still in business. They're actually people in those buildings. Um, they have 2,000 employees. Um, and this is an unintentional transit-oriented development. Uh, the developer of this, of this project, uh, the J.P. Paul Company, uh, was interested in getting the most building he possibly could on the site. Sunnyvale, California has a transportation demand management ordinance. And what it says is if you cluster the buildings so you can walk between the buildings, if you have some strategies to reduce the use of the car and slightly reduce your parking ratios, and if you connect to transit, that you can increase the size of your building. And so he was able, the developer was able to increase the building footprint by 60% on the site. Well, that's a lot. Uh, and, and the other thing that the developer did was they paid $2.5 million uh, for a station out of their own pocket. So this is privately financed station. So what this one does is it has a good relationship between the platform and the, and the TOD. It has a good relationship within the site. It has a terrible relationship for how you get to the adjacent community. But if we overlay security and paranoia about how the high-tech world works, we understand why you can't walk to the next site because they don't want you to do that. They have security guards to prevent you from doing that because they're worried about people stealing intellectual property. So here, that wasn't possible. So I think they did a, a, a good as, as possible job. Um, all of these pictures are taken actually from the platform, so you can see how close everything is from the platform. And these are you know, good relationships for the Silicon Valley. Now, the other key to success with TOD is plan for a mix of uses. And this is one where planners tend to go overboard. And when we plan for mixed use, we always use purple as the, as the color. And it's the same colors in the 2040 concepts. You know, purple are the centers of the mixed use. And what happens is, is that planners tend to go crazy and color everything purple. Because you know, mixed use is, you know, it's cool. It's great. Well, the problem is, is that mixed use is really difficult to implement. And there's only so much market for mixed use. And so we need to be really strategic when we plan for that mixed use so that it, we can actually implement it. We need to think about that if you do it, whether you're going to do it vertically or horizontally, we need to build strong partnerships with the developers that know how to do this stuff, that have the relationships with the financial institutions, that have the relationships with the retailers. The benefits of mixed use are very, very strong in terms of getting more walking, more transit ridership, reducing the use of the car. So it's a really important strategy, but we have to be really strategic on how we do it.
Um, Orenco is a great example of, of mixed use. It's getting to be uh, a better example. Um, you, a lot of you have probably been there. You know, and, and Orenco, like uh, the Gresham City neighborhood, uh, Civic Neighborhood, is, a, is still a work in progress. The top picture now shows that there's development south of Orenco. You know? We would have gone there a year and a half ago. That was a field, but now it's all you know it's populated uh, with development that meets Metro's minimum density. They didn't exceed it. You know they they met it. I think what is it at you know at 28 people per acre. Um, the town center uh, is vertically mixed use. It's got office out on the street on Cornell. The next row back has office and it's residential above. Retail at the ground floor. The parking is in the back. And let me tell you a really quick story about how developers think about this parking. Because, of course, there's, you know, there's parking there, as you can see, on the main street. But there's more retail than there are parking spaces. And so what, the, what, what they call that kind of parking is it's called teaser parking. And what that means is, is that you believe that you're going to be able to get a parking space. But since you can't, you keep following the teaser parking, and it leads you to the back where the real parking lot is. And so the teaser space has become a wayfinding device to take you to the, the hidden parking lot in, in the back. Um, based on uh, the, devel uh, the developer's information, Pat Trust information, uh, the retail uh, at uh, uh, Orenco Station is appreciating 20% faster uh, than the market uh, in the area around it. Residential is doing the same thing. Uh, based on Lewis and, uh, um, some work at Lewis and Clark and, and some surveys that, that TriMet did, it appears uh, that the work trip mode split at Orenco is about 18.2%. Uh, but what I think is more interesting is that in the single family, 45% of the people that live in the single family work for uh, Intel. Well, there's a big Intel plant right next to Orenco, so some of those people are either when they're driving, they're driving very short distances, or they're walking, or they're biking. Uh, some of them are working at, at, at home as well. So those numbers don't tell the whole thing, because we're not just solving transportation for transit. We're solving it uh, for a variety of different uh, pieces of the pie. Now, as we implement these projects, uh, having experienced leadership becomes really important. Uh, we recently did a study for Metro on how you implement regional centers. Um, and what we told Metro was, here are 10 factors for success on what, how you implement regional centers. But the number one most important thing is the presence of leadership, because it all comes down to people. You know, the market doesn't go out and implement these things. People implement these things. And of TODs are partnerships with, with the community, with the city, and with the development community, having that experienced leadership in place becomes really important. Having experienced transit agencies. So it's important there to take a long-term view, understand the market, and have that leadership in place. The round at Beaverton Central tells you why that's important, because it's a, it started out as a failed TOD. The city didn't have the sophistication. I spent an hour yesterday with the mayor of Beaverton, Rob Drake. Um, I don't think he would complain too much for saying that in public. He would, might not want to hear it, um, but they didn't have the sophistication. Um, there are some things that they could have done differently that would have helped that project proceed in a different way. Uh, the developer certainly didn't have sophistication to be able to do this kind of project. Um, they had done project, uh, very important projects in the past, but they hadn't done a mixed-use project like this. And one of the things that they did was they tried to build the project before anybody had agreed to finance it because they believed so passionately in their idea and they moved into construction without any financing whatsoever. And they asked the wrong question when they tried to get financing. They tried to finance it as one deal. But you can't finance mixed use in the United States as one deal. You finance the residential as one loan. You finance the office as another loan. You finance uh, the apartments as another loan. Well, the, are there apartments at, 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 at the round? No, they're condos. But the market study said do apartments. But since he needed to get cash, into the deal, he switched it to condominiums to try to get cash flow. So they, they just kept tumbling. So the city took the developer to court. They won. And then a lot of us watched nervously to say, well, what was going to emerge from bankruptcy? Would it even be a TOD? Would they just have more parking and a lot less of everything? And what's interesting 
is that the project that's on the ground today at the round is more transit oriented than the project that went bankrupt, meaning it has more residential units, it has more retail, it has more office, and it has less parking. Part of the reason is, is that that project is happening three years after the wet, when it was put together, three to four years after the west side opened. So there was market experience for what was going to happen on the west side. You had a more sophisticated developer. And so we actually ended up with a better project. We lost the developer. You know, somebody lost a lot of money. But in real estate, that happens a lot, not just next to TODs. It happens all over the place. I mean, one of the, one of the, uh, uh, you know, rules of thumb in complex urban projects is that the second or third developer is the person that's going to make the money. So don't think because the TOD found, went, went, went under water uh, in Portland that it was because it was a TOD. It was because of a lot of other things uh, that needed to be in place. So often, what you need to do is you need to do demonstration projects. Um, we did a lot of these in Portland. Um, and the idea with demonstration projects is to try to find a way to accelerate uh, implementation so that there are some uh, tires that you can go out there and kick. You, there are small successes that you can talk about. Englewood was a demonstration project in, in, in Denver. But the challenge with Englewood is that they tried to do this huge 55-acre project. So it took much longer to achieve. They didn't have the small successes. And in terms of leveraging other TOD in the Denver region, they weren't able to do that because they tried to do too much. So I always advise people to try to start with small projects. Not that big projects are bad, but it's easier to build on the success and the momentum uh, and the confidence that you can do by doing small projects that allow you then to do the big ones. Because then they become uh, uh, models for others to emulate, and you have then a baseline for your appraisers, for your developers, and your politicians when they're going to need to be able to put these kinds of projects together, because there are a lot of details uh, that go into that. So Center Commons, I said I'd talk about it. Um, and this project, there's an interesting uh, Portland State nexus here because uh, Carl Switzer uh, from our office got his master's degree here and did his thesis on how the transportation behaves here. And he did that because he read some stuff that, that John Charles in the back of the room wrote about this project, didn't think it was true. And so John and I can debate whether or not they're true or not. Um, and... Uh, um, so what was the project trying to demonstrate? It wasn't trying to demonstrate whether GB is right or wrong. Um, it was trying to demonstrate, can you do a mixed-use, mixed-income project in the Portland metropolitan area, and what would it take to be able to do that? Uh, it has for sale. It has rental. It has very low income. It has market rate in the project. Um, and what Carl did was he did a, a detailed tra uh, travel survey and looked at how is the market uh, responding to that in terms of, of transportation. And I'll talk a little bit about it here and then go to the next slide and give you some more information. And um, we can get you Carl's thesis if you want to look at it in more detail. 40%, 46% of the work trips from Center Commons are on transit. 32% of the non-work trips are on transit. Four TODs, uh, that's, a real, that's a really high number. Part of it's because of the income mix. Part of it's because of how it's parked. Part of it's because it has really high transit accessibility. It has a crosstown bus. It has a downtown bus. It has light rail, all within an easy walk. So here's some of those numbers. Auto ownership. After people move to Center Commons, and the low-income people moved to Center Commons not because transit was there. that They didn't give a hoot. They moved there because it was low-income housing, and they were going to be able to reduce their costs. And I, I don't know whether you know this, but the second highest expenditure in the United States for a, a household is transportation. The first highest expenditure for a household in the United States is housing. So we spend more on transportation than we spend on food. So if a low-income family can move to a place like Arenka, uh, excuse me, like Center Commons, the first reason that they're going to move there is because housing is their biggest expenditure. But what happened after they moved there is that auto ownership, in terms of the number of no-car families, went up by 42%, looking at had the cars that, where they owned a car before <coughs> and then after. 
Seventy-six percent of the, of the household income there is below twenty-five thousand. So I mean, part of this is because it's low income. The other thing that happened is that car ownership went down by one third after they got there. So, you know, we can debate the merits of that. This is what we found uh, from, from that study. Now, what I want to do fairly quickly is talk about kind of what's happening with some other systems in the United States. I've already given you pieces of some of that. Uh, San Jose. 30 miles of light rail, TLD at 14 of the 46 stations, very low ridership. You know, San Jose on a per capita basis probably has the lowest transit ridership uh, and very high cost. Um, part of its land use, part of its level of service, there are a lot, a lot of things. Um, but anyway, there are the numbers. Ohlone Chenoweth is a very interesting TOD. Uh, they took a, a seven acre park and ride uh, that had uh, 1,100 parking spaces, and they turned it into uh, 195 units of affordable housing and 240 park and ride spaces. The reason they were able to do that is because hardly anybody was parking there because it was on a stub line. They didn't have a lot of service. It's a $31 million project. It's highly subsidized. Um, the retail is in the wrong place, and it's failing. Um, underperforming because the transit agency in their wisdom decided that where there's the retail that where the retail goes is right next to the train well I'm sorry it doesn't the retail belongs out on the street where the cars are because um, ca retail needs cars to to perform so it's not performing now the really interesting strategy here is that what the city of San Jose has done is that they've used transit as part of a strategy to get more housing next to transit and they've achieved 20,000 residential units within walking distance of transit. So that's really phenomenal as part of an overall city strategy. And this is, this is actually the biggest TOD maybe in the United States. This is North Park Apartments. It's on First in San Jose. It's built by um, the Irvine Company, not exactly seen normally as a progressive developer. Um, 2,600 units. I mean, that's huge. Now, it's arguably mixed use because it has a Quiznos and a Starbucks. <laughs> it's not mixed use. Okay. It's luxury residential housing built at 40 units per acre in an area where the norm was about 16. So you, we've you know, nearly tripled the density from what the norm was. It's in, right in the middle of what they call the innovation triangle, meaning that there's high tech all around it. So the important part of the strategy here is starting to get more housing next to where all those jobs are. It's also served by two light rail stops. Um, so it's a real interesting project. It's just the construction is just getting finished. Whether or not you like uh, the architecture or how it fits together, but you know this is the Southern California uh, marketplace. Dallas. 47 uh, miles of light rail, billion dollars worth of development, about 40,000 riders a day. You can see the property value numbers. I talked about those earlier. Um, some real interesting projects in Dallas. Um, you know, in, in Texas, they say that TOD stands for Texans Only Drive. <laughs> Mockingbird Station. Uh, is the first example of a mixed-use project in, in, in Texas uh, targeted next to light rail. Uh, national developer Ken Hughes, UDC Urban, did this project. So he had a very sophisticated developer. It's a 10-acre mixed-use site. It's well-located. It's near the Central Expressway. It's near Southern Methodist University, so it's in a high-income neighborhood. Uh, the project, as you can see, includes uh, lofts, uh, retail, movie theater, office. The, ro the lofts are, I've been talking about market a bit. Let me tell you what the market segment is for here. And I bet you we didn't know that this market segment existed. It's for people that earn $70,000 or more per year, can afford to own, but prefer to rent, and want to live in an urban setting. Okay? I didn't know that market existed, but he's got a whole building full of those people. <laughs> Now, what's interesting is in this project, it's over-parked. It has $6 million worth of structure and parking spaces that the developer doesn't think are necessary. Because in Dallas, Texas, transit-oriented development actually is illegal. 
They've ref the city of Dallas refused to change any of their codes to park the project different because of proximity to transit. Okay. So the developer's exit strategy is that he wants to add a hotel and to have the hotel absorb the parking that isn't necessary. And this is this is you know this is this project has uh, theaters. It's got you know Virgin Superstore. I mean it's it's uh, it's got Urban Outfitters. Um, it's very upscale. Lots of activity there. Lots of people come and go on light rail. Uh, it's a very successful project. But this one's even more interesting. This is East Side Transit Village. This is in Plano. Plano is where H. Ross Perot has his headquarters. So this is not a liberal part of Texas. Originally, this was going to be a time transfer station. The city asked DART to change the location of the station. Uh, they then uh, acquired uh, this parcel here, offered it for development. Uh, it was entitled at 40 units per acre. Uh, the developer that they selected was um, um, Robert Shaw, uh, one of the founders of, uh, now of, of, of Post Properties, a former Dallas cowboy. That's important for developers down there. Um, <laughs> Shaw came back. Uh, he's partnered actually with Roger Staubach, who you also might have heard of as a, as a football player. Um, came back and said, this project won't work at 40 units per acre. I can't make it pencil. I need more density. City said, well, if you can get support of the downtown rep, the people around the downtown, downtown business community, that's fine. So they went through an intensive three-month uh, design process, came back to the city uh, with, with these kind of pretty drawings that you can see here, and said, this is what we'll do. Um, city said, that's great. Uh, the project was embraced. Um, so it's built at 100 units per acre. The most interesting part of this project is, is that then all the parking is here. Five levels of parking, all in structure. And you know we always carry around these rules of thumb. And the rules of thumb that most people carry around is that a structured parking space costs about $10,000. Structured parking space in this project costs $3,100. Because Shaw designs the parking first, works with the same contractor over and over again, and he's figured out how to make the parking work. Um, so it's, it, it's a very interesting project. It's outperforming the market. The other interesting thing there is he did not build this project with uh, light rail in mind in terms of the tenants. He thought the tenants would just logically come because of the market area. And he's now finding that they're coming because of DART. And he's able to get uh, what developers call givebacks, less givebacks, so less subsidies, less free rent. Um, and higher occupancy because of the, of the presence of transit. But as a conservative Dallas developer, he assumed that none of those things were going to happen and they all became uh, gravy, essentially. RTD in Denver, uh, 28 miles of light rail. I think I showed you my best example um, in terms of slides. But, but at, at the bottom, what you see is Millennium Park. Um, and this is along the Central Platte Valley line, which is a 1.6 mile extension of light rail. Um, in, in Denver, it serves uh, the baseball it serves on the edge of serving the baseball stadium. It serves the basketball stadium, the football stadium, an amusement park, uh, the redevelopment of Union Station. They just released the plans yesterday for redevelopment of Union Station. We're working on that project. And then major amounts of new housing and residential in the downtown. So that, that's a really exciting project that's happening right on the edge of downtown Denver. Uh, MTDB in, in San Diego, it's where light rail was invented in, in, in the United States. Uh, they've been in operation since 1986. Uh, they have five extensions, uh, nearly 100 miles of light rail, 84,000 riders a day, uh, TOD at a third of their stations. Um, America uh, Plaza is, is probably the best example of what we think maybe in a cartoon sense of what TOD is because you know the train would go through the building and you'd build the TOD around it. Well, at America Plaza, it really does do that. It goes through the building. Um, it does the same thing at the Mills, uh, uh, Mills office building, which is MTDB's headquarters. Um, in this instance, the story is really interesting, but I'll just tell the quick version of it. 
as they extended their line to the north, they needed to go from one alignment to the other, and they had to go through a specific parcel. Well, that parcel was planned to have the tallest office building in downtown San Diego on it, and they were kind of in the way of each other, and they were able to negotiate how to get uh, the train through to get private contribution towards the station and to do it all uh, on schedule even though this was in the middle of the failure of savings and loans and the developer went <coughs> bankrupt and out of business in the middle had to refinance the entire deal and still they opened the light rail line on schedule um, so um, you know this stuff isn't always easy um, let me st uh, end uh, with some Portland examples um, and then, um, so Russellville uh, Commons uh, is one that we often don't talk about, um, but I think it's a great example of, of TOD, an old school site. Uh, if the market would have done what it wanted to do, this would have been all big box retail because of its access to the I-205 freeway. Uh, the city had TOD zoning in place uh, that we had gotten in place in the 70s, and so they were continuously able to say no to that. Uh, the initial phase is 510 units. There's another phase that's under construction there now. It's parked uh, very tightly, and so that's, a, that's an interesting uh, project. Um, Gresham Central uh, was one of the uh, uh, earlier uh, projects in Gresham to be able to demonstrate some of these things. Uh, I, what I think is great about this, and I use it in other cities, is the, is the physical relationship of the train uh, to the front porches. And in this one, has some of the most innovative use of federal transportation dollars in the United States. Um, so, you know, we've all played the game of, of, you know, how many different ways can we connect to Kevin Bacon? Well, this is, the, we'll use the same nexus here. There's a type of federal transportation dollars called CMAC, and it's for cleaning the air. And so, what we were able to argue was that we could use CMAC dollars on this project because by building the TOD, it was going to clean the air. And this is how it worked. We said, well, first, to get more density, we need better design. And more density will give us more riders. And better design would be the gables and the front porches on the project. So by being able to get the gables and the front porches, we could get, bet, we could get higher density, and that would clean the air. And so the federal dollars were actually used to pay for the esplanade in the front the front, the, the front porches and the gables by arguing that better design would give you more density, which would give you more transit ridership, which would clean the air. Um, so this stuff isn't always straightforward. Um, so uh, some lessons learned. Uh, start early. Uh, Increase, in, including TOD in a rail project can in, in increase the overall rail project's viability, but you've got to work on the codes because it's illegal in most of the United States. The market for this stuff is real and it's growing. To be successful, we have to build new kinds of partnerships, bring new people to the table. Um, here are the 10 steps to success that I talked about. Um, and since you haven't um, asked me any questions yet, um, I would be glad to answer them if you have any. Thank you very much. Yes. I just want to know a little bit about transit oriented development or along bus lines or bus rapid mm -hmm. not just rail. Yeah. Um, we're doing some research on that now because I have to go to Atlanta in a few days and talk about that. So let me practice. Um, you can certainly do transit oriented development around buses. Um, there are some challenges, though, and there are market challenges because there's a perception that buses are inferior to rail, and it's a perception that developers hold. And so, if at a bus stop, if people are hanging out, developers think of that as loitering. At a rail stop, if people are hanging out, developers think of that as activity. It's the same thing. Okay. So part of it is, is to kind of how we think about our product. The other part of it is, though, you saw the number in San Diego that there were uh, 49 bus stop, uh, rail stops. I think there are 15,000 bus stops in San Diego. So then when we're trying to do it with buses, we have to be more strategic and more focused um, so that we need to pick a few places. 
Uh, the other thing that we need to do is to understand that maybe we don't talk about the bus at all, but we talk about urban infill or suburban transformation um, and work with those market dynamics and implement it, and it also happens to be next to a bus. And as part of the project, we, we have a nicer bus stop. We have better pedestrian connections back from the bus. Then what we end up is, is bus-oriented development but without ever saying the bus word because we've gotten beyond some of those perceptions. Now, a lot of people talk to international examples uh, and say, well, in Ottawa, they've done a lot, and they have. Or in Curitiba, they've done a lot, and they have. It's also helpful to have a dictator. Um, that's a different story. Um, and in Brisbane, Australia, they've done a lot. Um, and I was in Brisbane in October. I've done a couple of different projects there. Um, and we were having this kind of a conversation with their leading transportation and land use people. And I'd gone through something like this, and someone like you asked this question. They said, well, what about with buses? And I said, well, you know, that's very interesting because people all over the United States point to Brisbane as being one of the examples of who's done the best job with buses and development. And then my comment was, and now you understand how low the bar is. <laughs> and I think you can do a lot with it. I mean, you could argue that that uh, that you know the uh, Belmont Market is a bus-oriented project, but no one's called it that. It's an infill project, but the the bus goes by there more than every ten minutes, and there's a good relationship there, and you've got those uses. But so is it, or isn't it? Um, so uh, it. Right now, it doesn't have the, the, the glamour of rail in, in terms of working with developers. Uh, the Urban Land Institute, and you can find it, it's a, it's, a, it's a pretty document. It's a pretty good document. It's released a thing in, in June called the uh, 10 Principles for uh, Development Supportive Transit or some, something like that. I can give you a, a, a link to it later. And they talked a whole bunch about this issue, about kind of dealing with the bus and the perceptions. So it, it's a big issue. So. We'll go over here, and then we'll come back. So we'll come over here to John next. Was there a question on this side? I thought I saw a hand. John? Yeah, I mean, you, you mentioned that we need to allow paths to happen instead of making them illegal, which I agree with. And you mentioned that a lot of the projects have uh, above average returns for investors in the market, which is also true. If that's the case, it seems like the appropriate policy response would be to deregulate real estate around uh, transit lines so that Todd developers could find the best mix that works for them, and that we would not have to subsidize them because we're already going to make a premium. <clears throat> but in Portland, at least, that's not the case. Uh, you know that everything along the rail and the trolley is in intensively, prescriptively zoned, sometimes for uh, density and mixtures of uses and parking r ratios that are not going to work for anybody, so the land sits there idle, accomplishing nothing. And uh, we're shoving money into developers' pockets like crazy through these property tax abatements and CMEC grants and uh, TGM grants and uh, system development charge waivers, the whole, some combination of all those. And it's, it seems to me it wouldn't it make more sense then to just uh, let them figure out the best zoning and to not um, spend so much public money subsidizing them if they're already going to make above average returns. We, we, we can agree on some of those things, but you won't be surprised that we wouldn't agree on all of them. Um, some, uh, in, in, certainly in the city of Portland, there are uh, tax abatement available for transit-oriented development. And in Gresham, it applies to all the stations. It's selective, and it's only applied in certain projects in Portland. There's none in Beaverton, there's none in Washington County, and there's none in Hillsborough in terms of the tax abatement. So a project like Orenco didn't get any tax abatement. It's a $200 million project. It does have some subsidy, um, which I think some libertarians, maybe I can paint you with this brush or not, I don't know, um, uh, misuse the facts and say, well, uh, Orenco was subsidized. It has $500,000 in CMAC money to make the sidewalks wider and to pay for the ornamental uh, light fixtures. And that's called subsidy. If that's subsidy, that's fine. But $500,000 out of a $200 million project, I don't view as subsidy 
or cramming dollars into developers' pockets. I also started by saying that we should be careful about where we put that subsidy and what we're asking in exchange for it. And I think the city of Portland does a very good job on that. And if you look at what their criteria are, they say if we can increase the design in terms of better design, if we can increase the density over what the market would normally do, if we can increase the affordability of the project so that more people can afford to live there, that, that those are arguably public purposes that we'll do in exchange for that. In terms of being overly prescriptive, um, I've often argued that part of the problem that we have with TOD is that we're overly protective parents and that we, uh, that we lord over it too much and we don't let them breathe. And then for sprawl, we have no rules at all. And you know that, it, it, that it's ironic that in many communities the easiest thing to do is sprawl because you just go out and do it. You don't have to ask for permission. And the hardest thing to do is transit-oriented development because you have to get all these approvals, which is why I said that the most important thing for developers are to get the entitlements in place, to make it predictable, not, and, and that they're actually in favor of that. Now, within the Portland metropolitan area, we overly plan every square inch, not just the places around the light rail. So uh, it would be interesting to see if we could deregulate you know, the places around light rail and not the rest of the region, but I don't think that's going to happen. But one of the reasons why I think that there is an appropriate public policy for those areas around transit is because we have this larger public investment and the public good. And when we went to Washington County and to Beaverton and to Hillsborough on the west side and asked them to put regulations in place, the point that we made was is that we're going to spend a billion dollars, we collectively, not we TriMet, we collectively. And we want to get a return on that investment and that the places around rail are special places and that they need to behave in a way that is going to take advantage and be complementary of that investment. And then we showed Hillsborough, in particular, a market study that said, well, your city allows transit-oriented development today. The way that your market is behaving today, it would be auto-oriented. And so uh, it, that it was appropriate, right or wrong, that you only allow uh, transit-oriented uses within walking distance of transit because the market can produce auto-oriented uses every place else. And so we're going to say that these are special places. Whether or not that's good public policy, I don't know. But that's what we did. I think it was appropriate. So there's another question. That was a long answer. Is that the best place for it? Or, I mean, there's lots of considerations, but what do you do about it? Yeah, well, um, we, we, we learned from the band field that it's most difficult to do transit-oriented development in a freeway corridor. And one of the reasons that it took so long for development to occur, for example, at Center Commons, was that uh, the impact of the freeway. And that's why the design of Center Commons is, is the way that it is. And, and some people would argue uh, that it's a little bit cynical, but you know that the big, ugly block building next to the freeway also serves as a sound wall. And it makes it quieter inside of the project. And then it's very pedestrian oriented on the inside. So, you know, so those are some of the things that you can do. The, the thing that's interesting about I-205 is that the light rail isn't in the middle of the freeway, like say it would be in Washington, D.C., or in Chicago, and in, in some places we have rail and freeway corridors, it's on the edge. And that's because there was a decision made in the 1970s when they redesigned the I-205 freeway to first design a transit way that would be on the edges of the freeway. And there's actually a tunnel under the freeway that was built then uh, around Market Street to get from one side of the freeway to the other. It was actually the very first project that I worked on when I started working in Portland. And we designed 
the transit way first. Now, the, the other thing that this tells you is, is how long it takes to see some of these things, right? Because this was back in 1975, which is a little while ago. Um, so now the challenge is, how do you think about what the market is? How do you think about what the community wants to do and what the vision is there? What's the appropriate real estate response? How do you create these places that are pedestrian oriented and connect back to the rest of the community? Um, and I, I firmly believe that there are some good opportunities to be able to do that. Um, TriMet's evaluating right now uh, proposals um, from a number of different firms, specifically how to do that. Uh, we've given a lot of thought to that at Parsons Brinkerhoff, and they have our proposal in front of them. Um, and we've, pro we've provided some details, but until TriMet unwraps it, I'm not going to talk about it in any more detail today, but I, I think it can be done there. It's not as easy as going up the middle of interstate, um, but if there's a travel demand in that corridor, and there is, and a need, uh, I think the way that, that the alignment is done is, is a way where you can return value back to those communities, you can focus growth, and you can create things at a pedestrian scale, but it's, it's not as easy as other places. Any other questions? Yes. Wondering about Center Commons apartment that or center that's in my neighborhood. So one of the things that the neighborhood was upset about was the parking was so limited that the parking is spilling over into the neighborhood. So how does that affect, or is it effective? Yeah, and it's on the it's on the edge of, of, of my neighborhood. I live just down Gleason a little bit further in, in, in Laurelhurst. So I see that project a lot and. Part of the challenge in implementing those projects is that it's not enough just to reduce parking. Once you've reduced it, then you have to manage it, and you have to come up with management strategies for, it, for how to do that. And whether or not the city of Portland has been successful in managing that parking, because there is overflow parking there, I think that's un unarguable, it, is, is part of the challenge. Um, I don't think there's anything wrong with having parking spill over onto the streets. But when we do that, then we have to look at the capacity of those streets so that we don't just keep adding more and more projects that are double and triple parking uh, on the same street. Um, I was in uh, Boston on Tuesday, and uh, a friend of mine uh, had just moved out of Bunker Hill where he's lived for 30 years, which is arguably the most desirable neighborhood in, in Boston. But he moved out of it because he could never get a parking space. I mean, he's paying... Uh, $15,000 a year to park five blocks from his house. And so, you know, if places become too desirable and there's too much of a problem with limited parking, you hurt the place and you push people out. So I think it's a very valid concern. And uh, I would hope that the city will partner with the neighborhoods in terms of how they deal with that over time uh, because you have to manage those things. It's not enough just to turn the knob down and believe that we solved the problem. The other part of my question, the other part of the question had to do with the for sale units with the affordable housing and the senior housing all sold there together. That today this project's been done about, I don't know, three or four years, mm -hmm. and there's still unsold units there. So, does that an indication that people don't want to live with affordable housing and things like that? We, I mean, we there, I, I think there's is a um, there's the original developer of, um, well, there was two developers of that project, what, Lanier, who did the affordable, and then um, Affordable Housing, Inc., that did the for sale product. Um, and I play tennis with Ralph Austin, who was the original project manager for them, so I've talked with Ralph a lot about, you know, how did that work, and how did you pull those things together, and, um, you know, down into the details of, the, of, of that project. Um, you know, uh, there have been challenges there in in marketing the project and when they did it. Um, there were problems in uh, that it was originally overpriced um, uh, in terms of what they were asking on a per square foot basis. Um, I, and I think there are some challenges uh, that have been documented in the Oregonian and other places about how those different communities um, relate to each other. You know, they're in parallel with each other, but they're not really integrated uh, with each other. And so, um, you know, that, that project's a, um, 
is a learning experience. You know, none of these projects are perfect. Any one of these projects you can find problems with. Um, uh, what, what do you think they should do? My mostly my my problem with that project was the impact of the traffic on Gleason and Sixia. Right. And I personally had nothing, no problems living against, you know, with in that community, except that I wouldn't want to live on Sixtieth, and that's where they placed the for sale housing. Right. So I don't know that for sale housing was a really good alternative for that site. Yeah. Well, it, it, it's also a project where they were trying to create an urban experience and an urban lifestyle ahead of the market because that's not as much of an urban and edgy place for some people that might be looking for those things you know you could you can find it in other places in the marketplace less than you could find it at 60th and Gleason does that mean that we're done <laughs> you guys are very subtle here <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Yes, in the back. Uh, two more questions. Um, you might have to have an answer earlier. Nobody's heard it. I'm not sure what you're talking about. I was just wondering if you could tell us sort of what you're working on down there. Because I know it has a huge white rail network. Yeah, yeah. I'm working for uh, the government of Victoria um, and the development arm of the government of Victoria called Vic Urban. And I'm working specifically on a uh, project called Transit Cities. Um, and so Melbourne um, has adopted an urban growth boundary. Um, actually look to Portland, you know, whether that's good or bad. Um, adopted an urban growth boundary. Uh, they have um, then designated 13 transit cities as places that are a substantial amount of the growth is going to go. Um, and then they are moving forward with implementation of that uh, with uh, a number of the cities. And so I was there in October, and I'll be going back on a, on a regular basis about twice a year to work with them on uh, implementation of the Transit Cities program. And it's a great place to go. Anything else? Are we done? Yes. Avenue in the Chinatown, Old Town part of Portland, downtown Portland, compared to the Pearl District and other places that you just mentioned. Do you have any ideas why? Or I mean, First Avenue along the light rail? Yeah, where Port of Portland built, but I don't think much else. I don't think the expectations, I suppose, were higher than what we've gotten. Um, I'm not sure I've tried to answer that question before. Um, part of it's uh, fragmentation of land ownership. Uh, well, I guess the fr first, let's step back. There have been a lot of changes that have occurred in that area since the light rail went in, and there's been a lot of new development that's occurred there. Um, and it's been at more moderate scale densities, um, but there's been you know, the, a, a new federal office building there. Uh, the Port of Portland building, the uh, gas company building that was there, all those things weren't there before the light rail was there. And so what it's done is it's helped open up a transportation corridor in the downtown that wasn't there before. Um, the other thing to think about is that in the development of these systems, uh, development takes uh, place at a, a number of cycles over the marketplace. We've always thought of light rail, at least I always did, as being kind of like a hundred year investment. Um, and so when the development will occur at what stations is always very difficult uh, to predict. When we did market studies on, on the east side, um, some of the stations that the market economists said where the development would go were completely wrong and the development didn't happen there. At other stations they said there's never going to be any demand here. No, nothing will ever happen at 172nd. There will be no development there. Don't even build the station, is what our real estate economist told us. And we decided to build the station anyway. Um, you know, some people said that if you take all the economists in the world and you line them up head to toe, they still won't reach a conclusion. Well, this one tried to reach, 
This one tried to reach a conclusion, and we didn't listen to them. So I don't. Maybe I'm avoiding your question by just saying that in the fullness of time, I think things will happen there. Um, it's very complicated in the downtown with uh, PDC ownership patterns, what the minimum densities are. You know, John talked about overly being prescriptive and and lots of planning. You know, you can accelerate that uh, for downtown Portland. Um, so I think things will happen. On the other hand, some places it's not appropriate for the development to happen. Parts of that area are National Historic Districts, and it's enough for light rail to serve those. I mean, I always tell people that just because light rail is coming to your community shouldn't be a kiss of death that we're going to destroy the place. Um, I live in Laurelhurst. Okay. On one side of the freeway, you've got Hollywood. On the other side of the freeway, you have Laurelhurst. Well, maybe it's just enough for light rail to serve Laurelhurst. Maybe it doesn't have to change it because it's, you know, it's serving a place that's already vibrant. So I think that's the other part of it is that we also have to answer the question on First Avenue. Should it change? What's the appropriate use? And then what are the tools that are going to be necessary to overcome market barriers, if there are any, to have that occur? Okay. Well, thank you very much. I